have a very weird background. I was born in America, but brought up in Mexico and France and England. Um, so I'm, I'm Mr. No Borders sitting here already. Uh, my worldview has always been that that anything is open for grabs in terms of telling great stories. So, um, but one of the things that I've learned through making this film, Skin, is that we are incredibly tribal as human beings. Um, and we need to find a community that we identify with and that we feel that we belong to. And this leads to an incredible amount of um, exclusion, uh, it seems to me, which is not, not a good thing. So when you, when you look at um, the way that a lot of countries approach filmmaking, it's very much in terms of making you know, a British film uh, on a British subject. Very few British filmmakers, well, I mean, increasingly there are filmmakers who do look at other parts of the world, but very, very few filmmakers generally look outside of their own tribe. Um, and I think, um, I think that limits your possibilities. So, um, to, put it, to put it more succinctly, I think, I think being global filmmaking means making, making the world your creative oyster. Um, for my film, for Third Down Your Heart, um, it's kind of interesting because the, the subject of the film uh, was really like a cultural exchange, and in a way, the making of the film reflected that. Um, you know, it was about, as you saw, an American banjo player who goes to search for the roots of his instrument, and so there was a lot of exchange of culture going on every day with, with the, uh, the the local musicians sharing their music with with the band, with Bela, the banjo player, and he, he sharing his musical traditions. Um, and in terms of the way the film was made, there was just a lot of back and forth as well. It was an American crew that went, but we were we were really relying on on you know local filmmaking communities to help us out and to help make it possible. So in a way, the making of the film um, reflected the subject matter, and it really was a true exchange. And I guess to me, that in the context of our film, that's what global filmmaking is about. I've had the, the honor of shooting in, in many different countries. We have films on the festival circuit right now in Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, Brazil, Sudan, and, and Liberia. Um, and even my first film was shot on a Native American reservation, which is, is, a, is a wholly separate culture than, than mine. And so I guess what I always say first is I realize that I'm a tourist, that, I, that, I, that it's disingenuous of me to present that my vision of this culture is, a, is an inside vision. And, and therefore, I tr always try to ally myself and have uh, uh, filmmakers or participants involved who have a voice in the film from that culture. And in this case, the, the co-director, who unfortunately is somewhere over the mid-Atlantic right now, Siata, um, is, the, is Liberian and really brought uh, the Liberian identity to the film. And I, I think that's important on, on projects where you're outside of your own culture is to, is to ally yourself with uh, collaborators from that culture. Just anecdotally, our new film, which is called They Killed Sister Dorothy, and it'll show on HBO here, was bought by HBO here. Um, we premiered at a Brazilian film festival. It's a Brazilian story. And uh, at the first film festival we showed at, we picked up a Brazilian distributor. But also, and this is true in, in, in Liberia as well, that the majority of people will see the film through pirated discs. And that, that, that reflects no source of income for us, but if, if the importance, like it is for us as a nonprofit, to get your message out in the world. I'll literally, uh, as we did in Liberia, just drop a handful on the street and within days it'll be pirated. I mentioned certainly the, the, uh, the democratization of the, of the documentary medium and that there's a lot more competition now. I do find that um, festivals are more important than ever and that the festivals have become the gatekeepers for your film. The festival circuit has been very good to me and to some of our films, but it's capricious as well. Mm -hmm. and, and you may have a film that's dynamite and it just that didn't get those few, get to the right programmers. But, but has and, that seen that, that, that? Do you think that's seen well, they've, they've But they've got more power now, so it's, it's, ah, it's more difficult for your film to be seen by people by the, the gatekeepers within the, within the broadcast and I assume and you're the, the focusing world. on the important festivals, the festivals that are essential to you. Yeah, because you've you've got to you've got to be in those, those festivals. That's where they're at. They're here, and because they're more important, they can and they and they're flooded with more stuff. So it's gotten tougher. Absolutely. I think what it means is that your job as a filmmaker doesn't end with making the film. You've got to save very, some energy. Very important. You got to save some energy and save uh, all the save a little bit of money 
for the for the festival circuit for the selling of the film. Yeah. It because uh, even if you're in, as Anthony pointed out, one of one of those the big festivals, it, it's not a guarantee that someone's gonna swoop down and do all the work for you. There's this expectation on the part of filmmakers and hope and dream that your film is gonna get a theatrical release. That's gonna be a part of your filmmaking experience, and that's the you know the the, the ultimate. Like sell your like film territory by territory around the world and try and get the, the biggest price that you can in each country or each territory. And now that nobody's buying films or, or you know, is buying them for sums that are sort of very, very small. May I just um, jump in on that? Yeah. Much of that sales around the world was based upon how it was going to fare in the US, who had bought it for how much money and what its US prospects were. So when you wipe out the independent prospects in the US, the knock-on effect is everybody else is down. Exactly. The US was always the big prize on the sales estimates, you know, the, the, the largest figure. There are now, there has to be a new model, a new way of, and we're all trying to figure it out, of how, of how to actually reach audiences in sufficient numbers and have them pay, even if it's a couple of dollars for what we're doing, but if the numbers are high enough and we can distribute directly to them, then there's a chance of getting that money back to the investors. Um, I just think that ultimately in countries where your film is gonna be pirated, um, um, in Liberia it will be retitled, it will be, you know, it'll be the worst possible copy that if I can have, because we're a nonprofit and our most important, uh, our most important thing in developing countries is that people see these films, that I'm, I'm fine with having some control over that by by making copies available for piracy. You, but unfortunately, the, the distributor is the person who's going to get the money. It doesn't filter back to the filmmaker. So unless there's some way of directly distributing your DVDs for five bucks, you know, it, it doesn't help us. But there is, as you described a minute there ago, is, so is, the, the new paradigm, I think which it's is happening in music also. People it, creating their, their own Facebook page and creating their yeah. own system of distribution before going out. I think all of that self-distribution works really well, provided you have a good shop window where people can see your product and actually you know, be aware of it. And that's why I was saying that the festivals are quite good you know, as a starting point. And then you have to have other places where you can somehow make people aware that your film exists. Otherwise, you can have your Facebook page, but nobody will go there. You've had just a tiny bit of experience with an offer for digital distribution, and, and um, it just seems like such an unknown right now. Uh, nobody knows if they're going to make any money. Nobody knows if anyone's going to watch it. Um, nobody knows, you know, what's going to happen. So it's really hard to say. But I, you know, I think. Yeah, there, I guess there are some dangers in that in terms of selling off territories before you've sold off territories. The key is uh, inform yourself as much as you possibly can. Um, I didn't start off writing the script of Skin because I just didn't feel I understood enough about the culture and I didn't want to uh, impose my, my complete ignorance on, on this story which was so specific. But by the end of this kind of seven year period, I, I know quite a lot about South Africa now. And I think, I think it is, the key is really to try and be as respectful as possible of that culture and learn as much as you possibly can about it so that you can work you know, with them and not be patronizing and not make assumptions. I mean, I would definitely echo that in terms of research. We, for our film, we were in four different countries in Africa. We were in uh, Mali, the Gambia, Uganda, and Tanzania, and so there were, lots of differences um, everywhere we went and um, part of it was just being prepared doing as much research as we could but in, once you get there it kind of doesn't really matter you're just in the middle of it and you're improvising and you're doing whatever you need to to, to make your film and it worked oh, I promise we'd end on, a, on an optimistic note and I think that's it uh, the, forget the borders let's figure out the bridges thank you very much thank you guys